everybody and welcome to worship this morning. Uh, today there will be millions of people gathering in church and I was reading a, book, a bit of reflection from Eugene Peterson who said, you know, people are worried about the decline in people attending church. His comment is, he's amazed that people actually go to church. And uh, he said, why would they go when they, they can go to the zoo, they can go to sport? And he said, um, millions of week, millions of people every week keep showing up to worship God. I am far more astonished that people do come than distressed when they don't. So why do they do it? Why do we do it? It's simple. We come to see, to get our vision cleared of the ugliness and trash so that we can see what God is doing in the heart of it. We come to hear, to clear our ears of the noise of anger and lust that pollute the atmosphere and listen to those love, to love spoken to our hearts, forgiveness to our sins, mercy to our failures and grace to our needs. We come to touch, to break through the social makeups and protective role playing and touch one another in greetings of welcome and acceptance. And we come to speak, not words that flatter or sell or manipulate, but ones that speak what we most deeply are and feel, that honestly confess our sin, that reverently sing our praise. Lives turn around, open up and come alive in the act of worship. Worship launches us into the rich, invisible inflow of holiness, the action and word of God. Let's pray. Loving God, we come to you in an act of worship this morning. And we pray that as we come, that we will come unloading our, our sins in an act of repentance. Take away anything that would stand in the way of us worshipping you in spirit and in truth. Cleanse us, renew us, refresh us and rejuvenate us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to share with you a passage from Hebrews this morning. I'm, I'm going to ask Ben to come and uh, bring the reading to us. Thanks, Ben. Praise God, and I hope you're all well this morning. It's uh, going to be a great day in the Lord, hearing uh, the, the message that God's put on Russell's heart. And it all starts in Hebrews. Hebrews 11, 32, through to Hebrews 12, chapter, uh, verse 3. What more shall I say? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets whom through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of flames and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and Rooted, uh, routed foreign enemies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to release so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced years and floggings and even chains of imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes in the ground. These were all com commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together... With us would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary or lose heart. 
Praise God. Hebrews is wonderful. So we'll get Russell back to uh, share us this message and yeah, bring open ears. Praise God. Thank you, Ben. I'd like to share with you this morning some thoughts from that passage. And I wonder if you'd just follow through on your Bible, if you'd open them up and just start at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. And uh, what I want to do is just to share some of the things that, uh, it, that I have uh, gleaned from it. And as you read through, of course, you too will find something maybe different, uh, but something also uh, from that, as these words speak to you. And if we have a look at uh, the first part of that, he talks about people like Barak and Gideon and so on. It's interesting that a friend of mine became a Christian and he was so excited he decided to read the Bible through. And he started at Genesis. And he hadn't gone long into Genesis and he was amazed. He said, I thought all these guys in the Bible were, were saints and they were pure and they were, they were blameless. But he said, they were just a mob of rogues. <laughs> and, uh, and he's right in a way. If we have a look at that chapter 11 in or chapter 11 in Hebrews it's often called the chapter of the heroes of the faith and the writer there lists a lot of these people from the old testament who found there by faith they were received by Christ and so yet as I looked at that and we just pick up the tail bit of that those heroes there are a group of there that when you look at them they hardly fit into the category of heroes <laughs> They're very ordinary and they're not impressive. If you have a look even at the ones that are there, Gideon. Gideon was hesitant. He was uncertain. You remember the story that God called him to, to get an army to beat the enemy and he told him the army was too big and Gideon was a bit uncertain about everything and so he put out a fleece and said, Lord, you know, if, it's, if, one, if the dew's wet and the fleece is dry, then I'll know it's you. And so God did that and answered his prayer and he still wasn't sure. So the next day he said, Lord, if the fleece is wet and the grass is dry, I'll believe you. He was hesitant and uncertain. Barak refused what God called him to be. If you look through the book of Judges, Deborah, a prophetess, summoned Barak and said, the Lord commands you to go and conquer this army. And Barak said, I, I can't. But if you go, I will go. But if not, I not. Barak had no self-confidence. He had to take Deborah, a woman, to be the, the one who attacked Samson. Samson was a bit of a disappointment. In fact, one of the biggest disappointments, I think, in the Bible. So much promise. So much expected of him. And yet his life was wasted in self-indulgence and anger. Jephthah. Jephthah sacrificed his own daughter. <laughs> David, David was a murderer. Samuel's kids went crazy. You know, these guys are nothing like Superman or James Bond. <laughs> they were brittle. And so when you look at them, they were brittle heroes of the faith. And so looking at those heroes, there are three things I can take away from what I call the brittle heroes. And the first one is that I can relate to these guys. There's not too many things that you have done or, one, or we have done that you can't find someone in the scriptures that has gone along a similar track. In fact, some of them have done worse. I've never sacrificed a daughter, for example. I can relate to their hesitancy. I can relate to their lack of faith, their self-doubt and their self-indulgence. They are ordinary people. And so from that, the second thing I, I realise as I look at those heroes of the faith is that they are heroes of what they believed in, of, of the faith, and not of their actions. They were heroes of the faith, but not of their actions. Gideon's faith was feeble, but he kept his faith, and through his faith he overcame incredible odds. By faith, Barak and Jephthah both had victories in battle. By faith, Samuel, at the end of his life, came to his senses and achieved great things for God. 
By faith, David was called God's anointed. In spite of what they did, they were commended for what they did through faith. And the third thing I get out of that is that they overcame things through faith. Why were they better than Superman or James Bond? Because they didn't depend on their own strength. Through faith, they relied on God and God achieved great things through them. So there we have this list of heroes of the faith. And if you look a little bit further to chapter 11, verse 33, through to the end of that chapter, the writer lists a whole lot of things that they overcame through faith. They closed the jaws of lions. They quenched the fires. They did incredible things, through their, not through their ability, but through their belief and trust. And I look at that section from chapter 30, from verse 33 to 39, and it's interesting that you see two distinct groups of people. There are those who achieved great victories, and there are those who, achieved, who, who finished up undergoing incredible persecution. And as we go through the Old Testament and the New Testament, we find two groups, there's two groups of people coexist. People who both trusted in God and for some they achieved incredible things. They got their, their children back to life. They saw people come back to life. They saw miracles performed. They saw other things happen. And yet there are others, it says some were sawn in two. <laughs> they were persecuted for their faith. And you see, I'd rather be in that first group than the second group. But it brings to my mind one of the big questions, or two of the big questions. The first one is that why do people suffer? Why do people suffer? But the second one that really I struggle with is why do some people struggle more than others? Why did Job and Jeremiah have a rough trot and if people like Haggai did okay? I don't fully understand that. But I can only share a few things on suffering, on what I believe. And the first thing I think we need to know is that we should not be surprised if we suffer for Christ. Jesus warned us of that. M. Scott Peck wrote a book called The Road Less Travelled. It's got about 250 pages, but if I can tell you it in two sentences, he said, life is difficult. Once you realise that, it's easy. That's the book. Life is difficult. Once you realise that, it's easy. What he's saying is some of us think we can go through life without experiencing any pain or any trouble, any anxiety, any self-doubt. And if you think that, you're headed for disaster. But if you realise, not go looking for things, but realise that there will be sometimes a struggle, a pain, a suffering, then you're, you're equipped to handle it a bit better. Suffering is an incredible, and pain are often the, 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 the companions that we don't want to be with us. And yet sometimes we grow incredibly through them. Um, a a well-known politician made a bit of a gaffe where he made a comment that he and his wife were blessed not to have any children with disability. And he got a big backlash from parents of people with, or, and people, parents of people with disabilities and people with disabilities. And while his, in, while he was in, intentions were honest, he might have made a bit of a faux pas. But the reality is that no, I can't remember or recall anyone who has prayed and said, God, I want you to make me suffer. I want to go through tragedy. I want to have a child with a disability. We don't pray for those things. But sometimes going through those things brings out a depth and a quality in us that we never knew before. Rabbi Harold Kushner says this. Um, he said, some people go through life and, and there's no mishaps and everything's fine. And other people go through life where they, they find that they struggle with God, a tragedy happens, they doubt their faith, they go through this anxiety. And he said... They come through at the end of it with a greater and more determined faith in God than before. And it's interesting, he calls it being twice born. And he said those people 
are sometimes better off than those who never experience everything. The writer of the Hebrews says the world was not good enough for them. And, and Paul says, if we die, if we live with Christ, we die with Christ. We suffer with Christ. And so in anything we go through in terms of suffering, it's not why do we suffer, but the fact that Jesus walks with us in our suffering. Our faith and our values are on a collision course with the world's values. So that will mean that you will face opposition, you will face anger and you will face trials. So I think the question is not why do people suffer, but when we do, God, where do we go to from here? Because God will use our pain. He will use our suffering. And he will bring it to bring us to a richer and greater experience of life. So we move on to that little bit of chapter 12 which says, therefore, <clears throat> therefore, and I love therefore, he's saying in the, in the light of all the heroes, what does that mean for us? In the light of reflecting on the heroes of the Bible, what does that mean for us? And he, that passage to me implies four things that we can do. Number one, travel light. <laughs> travel light. If we want to be effective in the race of life, then we need to shed all the things that carry us down. How many of us carry things from 10, 20, 50 years ago and they're still, we're still carrying them? Do you know that I cheated in grade two? We had a spelling test and <clears throat> to find out who was the best speller. And it came down to myself and a boy named Ken. And, uh, and I have to say, the, the spelling that I, we were given, I didn't know, so I cheated off him. And I won the next one and I won the spelling bee. We had a 50 year reunion of our senior class. <laughs> and who should turn up but Ken? And uh, I said to Ken, love to have coffee with you sometime. And so we had coffee and I was going to apologise for cheating on him when I was six years old. And anyway, uh, as we talked, I said, Ken, do you remember in grade two we had a spelling bee? And he said, I don't remember that. <laughs> And I thought, I've been carrying this for 60 years and really it's something I should have let go a long time ago because God had forgiven me for it. But we do, we look at the things that have brought us shame and we carry them. How many, how many of us have minds filled with fears, with anxieties, with worries about things that have happened in the past where we should let them go? We're running forward. Travel light. The second thing is to run with perseverance. We're in a marathon, not a sprint. The Commonwealth Games are on at the moment and I always find it intriguing to watch the sprinters and watch the marathon runners. The sprinters come out and they got their chest puffed up and they're eyeing each other off and eyeballing each other and uh, puffing and puffing and trying to out, outsmart the other runners. And so when the gun goes, off they go. And 10 seconds later, there is a hero with his hands in the air and waving a flag and there are other people deflated. But there is no interaction. Do you notice that? I'm the best and you're not. But with a marathon, do you notice that the winner wins and then waits to see who comes second and who comes third? And often they embrace each other as they cross the finish line. There is a different atmosphere because they know what the marathon runners have to go through to get to the finish line. Our excuses for dropping out of the marathon are so feeble. And God wants men and women who are running with perseverance, not in a sprint, but being able to go through the pain of a marathon. The third thing in there, it says to focus on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Mm -hmm. How often we tend to take our eyes off and like Peter, we find ourselves sinking and then we cry out, Lord, save me. There's a story about a man who was in the trenches in World War II, surrounded by the enemy soldiers and it looked like he was in, di well, it didn't look like, but he was in dire trouble. And he prayed and he found himself praying, God, I haven't bothered you for 20 years. And if you get me out of this mess, I won't bother you for another 20, I promise. <laughs> you see, that's not the way God wants us to communicate with him. He wants our eyes to be fixed on Jesus, the author 
and sustainer of our salvation. Keep your eyes firmly fixed on him. And then he says, Jesus who went with joy. The fourth thing I think we need to remember is that this is not a race that we run with fear. We run with joy because Jesus is with us. So then the four things that I found from that was to travel light, to run with perseverance, to focus on Jesus and to not let become a joy sucker or let the joy be sucked out of you. And this morning we're going to sing four hymns that reflect it. The first hymn is about the grace of Christ in allowing us to travel light because all of those things that we carry, the burdens, are lost through Jesus' forgiveness. The second one, the second hymn is about being a man of faith, to rise up and sing. The third one is about Jesus is Lord. And the fourth one, joy is to flag, flown high in the castle of my heart. They all reflect those four aspects and I'd love for you to take them with you. Travel light, run with perseverance, look to Jesus and experience the joy of knowing him. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you that the scriptures have recorded heroes of the faith. And they haven't brushed over their blemishes or their, their misgivings or their misfortunes. And Lord, we can, that's how we can relate to them. <coughs> Sometimes we carry this burden of thinking we're not good enough. Well, neither were those guys. But Lord, that's irrelevant. The fact is that you see us through the eyes and the lens of Jesus Christ. And you see us as blameless. People who are washed clean only through the grace of the blood of Jesus. So Lord, we pray that we would run the race. Run the race with perseverance, with our eyes on Jesus and with joy because the one who is the sustainer and the keeper of the universe walks beside us and runs with us. Be with us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.